book of Second Samuel chapter 11. Second Samuel chapter 11. And we are going to be reading from verse 11, uh, going all the way to verse uh, 6. Uh, Second Samuel chapter 11, we are going to read from verse 1 uh, to 6. But we will, of course, look into uh, issues affecting chapter 11, uh, chapter 12, and uh, other chapters as well. But we are just going to read those uh, first six verses, okay? Um, and remember, uh, we did say last week, uh, from this week, we will start to point at people for reading. So I hope uh, people get their Bibles ready because we need to, to, to do some participating um, in these sessions. So we're in the book of Second Samuel 11, Second Samuel 11, uh, verse 1 to 6, and this is what uh, it says. It happened in the spirit of the year, uh, in the spring of that year, at the time when the kings went out for war, that David the king sent Joab and his servants with him together with all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon, they besieged Rabbah, but David chose to remain in Jerusalem. Then it happened that one evening, when the king David rose from his bed, walking on the roof of the king's palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was beautiful to look at. So David sent and asked concerning the woman, and someone replied, saying, Is this not Bathsheba? She is the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers. He took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent word to the king that he be told that I am with child. And David said to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the joy of reading your word. And thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit who interprets the word. And thank you for the Holy Spirit who also makes sure that the word comes to life in our lives. So, Father, we pray. Do not permit us to miss any lesson in the word or any power that is in the word. This we pray through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the book of uh, 2 Samuel 11, we find the well-known story beginning of David and the woman that would later become the Queen Bathsheba. Now, we know from verse 1 that uh, it was spring of that year, and it was the time for kings to go to war. Now, when we look at the history of the Middle East, we know that uh, they were not uh, perhaps as unpolite or as uncivilized as uh, many would fight today. In the ancient Middle East, the kings had an agreement that it is better to fight in spring when there is enough sunlight, enough water, and of course, uh, in terms of weather, it is hot, so the soldiers will not die from a winter cold, but also it was not summer such that the rain is so much that there is mud and drenching. Spring is a balanced season. 
and so in the Middle East, kings had an understanding that rather if we are going to fight each other for whatever reason, let us fight each other in spring when we have enough resources, enough sunlight, and also we have enough rain and water for us to be able to sustain our armies. In modern day language, it will be called a gentleman's war. That is the way that they preferred to fight one another. Our king, however, in the story, David, he no longer traveled with the army when there was a war to fight. And of course, there was a good reason for this. David had learned very well that uh, the armies of Israel do not necessarily conquer because of his presence and leadership, but because of the presence of God and his leadership. And of course, later in the book of Psalms, um, he would tell us this, uh, and it would be hinted as well uh, in the book of Proverbs by his son Solomon, uh, David would say to us, some trust in horses and chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord. So David had learned that the victory of Israel has nothing to do with the army, but has everything to do with the presence of God. So when they went to war, he did not attend all the time because it was not so necessary. And all he would just wait for is a report that would tell him of the victories that God has given um, to the army or to the armies of Israel. And this evening was no different. And the king, unable to sleep, decided to walk uh, on the roof of his uh, palace. Of course, uh, their roofs are different to ours. Their roofs are functional roofs. They use them. Uh, the women will use the roof for making mats, for threshing wheat and barley. The men would use the roof for their carpentry and uh, other duties that they needed um, to perform. Or if they were drying skin, uh, 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 maybe after slaughtering a cow or a goat or a sheep, the, the, the skin has to be used, of course, for, for clothing, for leather and other things. So they would dry them at the rooftop. So in the ancient uh, Middle Eastern architecture, the roof is a very functional part of a family activity. Unlike uh, in the Western architecture, where the roof is designed to simply protect uh, uh, the house from the wind and the rain and also to collect water from the rain. Their roofs were quite functional. So that is why he could walk on the rooftop because their roofs are flat and there's always a door and a staircase with access to the roof. So he goes out, he walks, okay? And a few points that uh, we are led by the Holy Spirit to look at today that we want to sit on. He then sees a woman bathing. And we know why she is bathing. The Bible tells us um, in verse 5 why she is bathing. She is bathing because she had been on her periods. Now, according to Leviticus, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. According to Leviticus, when a woman has been on her periods, she will then spend the next seven days after the periods untouched. And then after those seven days, she will bath as a symbol of purification. Women would usually bath in the evening uh, as a symbol of their purification, that the periods are over and the seven days uh, of a cool off are also over, she will bath. And of course, by bathing, she would also signal to her husband that she is ready for sexual activity. And so Bathsheba was bathing. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this one, but 
any of us here who are uh, old enough and those of us who are married, you will know that uh, scientifically speaking and uh, generally speaking, women will ovulate on the 10th day. Ovulation simply means she will release an ovum in the ovaries that is ready uh, to be fertilized by the sperm or the seed of the man. But women will vary. Some will ovulate even five days after their periods, some up to even 12 or 13 days. And so even with our forefathers long before the arrival of contraceptives and all of those things, they knew that uh, if you wanted to avoid getting the wife pregnant, try not to participate somewhere around the 10th day because it is at the height of fertility. It is at the height of fertility. After that, she remains fertile, but it is dampening down, dampening down as she then makes her way again to another period. Now, why am I specifically explaining all of this uh, biology? Is, is, is it necessary? Not for the biology itself, but for what it symbolizes. You see, David knew this biology. As a Hebrew man, he knew this biology as spiritually and physically. As a man, he knew that when a woman baths at night, he knew what it meant. Generally, women there will bath uh, just after sunset, when it's becoming cooler. That is when they are just having a normal day-to-day -day bath. But when they bath late at night, it is a symbol that they are purifying themselves after um, the, the, the period that we have explained. Now, this is important because even though David saw all of this and knew exactly what it meant, he still wanted her. He still demanded that she be fetched and brought to him. And that is our first lesson this evening. Sin will produce in us an arrogance that will even make us ignore the signs, even when God is warning you, even when God is sending a clear message that says to you, do not do this. Don't do this. But sin has a way of generating in us an arrogance that blinds you to the warning of God. And by blinding, what do we mean? The second aspect of it. Sin has an arrogance that makes you feel invisible, like you are untouchable, like this will not happen to me. Many, many, many people have tried to commit adultery in your presence. They got caught, their marriages were destroyed, or the marriage survived but was struggling. You've seen this, yet sin convinces you that no, you are smarter than everyone else. You are going to have an extramarital affair and never get caught because you and the devil are twins. You share the same IQ. No one will catch you. You forget. Even the devil got caught. So why will you not get caught? That's the problem. Sin creates a powerful arrogance that blinds us when God is screaming, you know, um, these days it's not really done that much because of the advances in technology. In the olden days, when an aeroplane had landed in the airport, in order for the aeroplane to see how to park and how to come in properly, 
there would be those signal guys with their flags busy directing the plane as it, as it is coming in and the captain would watch them because the plane is too big it's not like driving a car he can't really manage all the proportions of the plane as he brings it in so those signal guys would be there for that these days the technology has become so advanced the gps signals the radar and the sonar systems in the airports will guide an aeroplane into centimeters of accuracy but let me share this with you when we are on our way to temptation god like a signal man will stand between you and the sin and heaven will do the best it can to say to you do not do not come this way every x that heaven can make will make to try and say please we are trying to save your life don't go there unfortunately many are arrogant like david whatever signal god gives as a warning is disregarded as nothing more than simple fear that can be overcome in the pleasure of the sin we have seen people time and time again leave god behind and ruin their lives and yet you are convinced that you will leave the presence of god and you will do better than others we have seen many people time and time again go into alcohol saying i am just going to drink one glass a week today they are alcoholics who have lost everything they have ever had when we go through cities sleeping under bridges sleeping in homeless shelters are judges doctors lawyers accountants actuaries businessmen teachers nurses engineers technicians plumbers people who used to take care of their families they now cannot even tell the difference between sunrise and sunset what happened it's not that they knew no one who had done alcohol and drugs and did not come back it is the arrogance that sin puts in all of us a sense of invisibility i will do better they were stupid i am smarter i won't get hooked into it i know a better way i know how to take the better quantities i know how to cheat and hide from the wife i know what to do with the phone i know what to do with the laptop i know how to do all sorts of things let me warn you david was warned heaven sent him a powerful red flag don't go there she is fertile she is at the height of her fertility what you will do will not end the way you think this is why the death of that child many people want to hold it against god and say no but uh, why did the child have to die the parents knew what was going to happen they thought they can outsmart sin and outsmart god let me share this with you as a very good warning coming from the throne of god when the bible says there is no temptation that you will go through that god has not given you strength for that verse must be read carefully it doesn't mean then go through every temptation it means when a temptation is beyond you god has also provided enough warnings for you to turn back do you understand that 
You don't have to experience everything and then say, God promised power to deal with the temptation. Yes, he did. But there are two types of power. Sometimes it is the power to run and don't enter. Sometimes it is the power to survive when you are inside. But by all means, please hear me very carefully. It is the false teaching of this world. Experience is the best teacher. But according to God, his word is the best teacher. You don't need to experience things to know they are not good for you. You can hear God warning you. You can hear God saying, my child, don't go down this road. Listen to him. You have been warned. Too many of us are sitting with evidence that this thing will destroy you. But we are ignoring God. Ignoring him. We are convincing ourselves that I know better I will do better. Better than who? Let us look at the two forces you are between. You have an immortal, only wise, most powerful God warning you not to do this. You have an ancient serpent, a deceiver and a liar, the father of all lies, tricking you to do it. At what point do you think you can outsmart these two? Honestly, you were born. When were you born? 1940, 1950, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and the 1990s. At what point do you think you are older than these two? As long as you remember your birthday, Know that you are too young to be trying to play with these two. Neither of them have a birthday you can remember. God doesn't even have a birthday. The devil has one when he was made, but its date is far, far, far behind what any of us could ever remember or were ever present at that time. We would do well for our sakes, for our growth spiritually, to listen to the evidence, to listen to the signs. If God sends signals and he says to you, warning, do not enter, it would be good that you don't enter. It would be good that you turn back. God was merciful to David. Saints, God was merciful to David. He sent this man a sign but the man chose to ignore it. And my prayer is, may you never ignore the signs. The signs are not only about sin, dear friends. The signs are not only about sin. The signs are also about danger. You know, there are things that are not sinful to do, but that are dangerous for you, that God as a loving father does not want you or I to enter into. It could be business that God is warning you not to get into. It could be a relationship that God is warning you not to get into. Please listen to the signs. Listen to the signs. You know, it could be a simple thing. I have listened to testimonies. I've listened to testimonies with individuals who would call me or who would WhatsApp me and say, you know what, Pastor, this weekend I'm supposed to take a trip uh, that goes to this particular place. But the person will say, but my spirit is not okay. Something is just telling me not to go there. And the person would say, can you please pray with me? And we would pray, and we would pray, and we would pray. And when the time for the trip comes, the message would not have changed. Still, we are both feeling it, that something is saying, don't go there. And the person would say to me, you know what, Pastor, having prayed with you, I am convinced that I shouldn't go on this trip. And then 
a day or two later, the person hears that there was a massive accident there and, and there were multiple fatalities. And, and then you begin to realize that, you know what, it's not just about this particular person, but it could be about even everyone who may have gone there, where God would have said, don't take this trip. Don't take this one. This is one of those where the devil is like a, 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 a hunter. He has laid a snare and you will not make it. It's those simple things for me that God is not irresponsible about our lives. He always issues warnings. But for some reason, we've convinced ourselves not to listen to him. I don't know what makes us think we're smarter than him. All I know is he loves us more than we can love ourselves. And when he sends a warning, he's not trying to ruin your life. He is protecting a life that he loves. Mind you, mind you, the reason God sends a signal is not because he can't rescue. That has nothing to do with his power to rescue. It has everything with what I said. God does not want any of us to have any bad experience more than we already are having by being born in the world of sin. Listen to me. God is trying to minimize as much as possible all your bad experiences in this world. And so these warnings are not about God saying, oh, let me warn you before you enter, because once you enter, I can't rescue you. No, I can rescue you. The challenge is, I know the pain you will go through before I rescue you. For that reason, I love you enough to say, I would rather avoid your scars than for you to get them. I don't know where we are ignoring God right now. I don't know why God is sending me to bring um, this message from this angle, this warning. We've, we've done warnings before when we talk to each other in this group. But again, it is something that God is bringing across to say, I need to emphasize this again, that there are many among us here who are, praying for signs to things. Yet when God has given a sign, we ignore it as if he has not spoken. When God wants, listen, it comes from love, not from hate. Now, David didn't listen. The sign was there. This woman is fertile. What you want to do is not going to end the way you think. But David was full of himself. He was full of success. He was not going to listen. He brought her in. He seduced her. She liked the idea. Of course, it appears Bathsheba was herself ambitious. She wanted to be a queen one day, being married to a soldier, uh, living on a soldier's salary, may no longer be the life that she wanted for herself. She wanted more. She wanted big. She wanted a king-size bed in her bedroom. She wanted to be served. Uh, instead of being the one always serving her husband, she wanted a palace of her own. So she decided this is a good thing to do. And of course, she also ignored the signs. David is not the only one. She knows her body. She is a woman. She knows exactly what is going to happen. Or maybe Bathsheba wanted what was going to happen. Maybe Bathsheba knew that she was at the height of her fertility and that getting a child with the king would certainly secure her place in the throne. I do not know. But clearly, these two chose to ignore the evidence that was there. Perhaps one thing I also want to share about the evidence is that the, the, the warning came through a scientific piece 
of evidence. The warning was not spiritual. They did not get visions. They did not get dreams. It was pure scientific, natural bodily function. And maybe that's something I need to say to some of us here. The signs you are looking for may not always take a spiritual tone. Maybe some of us are waiting for Gabriel to arrive when God is giving you a sign through simple, scientific, financial uh, means where the sign really is not majestic. It is just a pure, rational answer from heaven saying, this is what will happen if you do this. Okay? One pastor I listened to uh, some years ago made a very interesting statement. Uh, 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 he picked uh, Coca-Cola, uh, for example, as, as, as a, a drink um, well known for its highly unhealthy uh, 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 properties. Okay? But for some reason, the way it was designed, the way it was made, it has the whole world addicted to it. So this pastor made an interesting um, statement when, uh, when I was listening to him. He says, it doesn't make sense if you drink Coca-Cola every day and yet you pray for health every day. It doesn't make sense. There is no magic to your prayer. Stop the drinking and then the health will come because what you are looking for doesn't need an angel. It needs you to just obey the laws of health. That's what we mean. Not every sign in our lives needs an angel. Some warnings from God need you to simply listen to nature. Nature will tell you, God is right. Don't do this. But they didn't. They conceived. I'm going to skip um, Uriah and jump straight um, into the situation with the child. And I will leave the rest of the consequences that followed um, later on. I just want to dive into specifically the situation with the child. So as we know, David makes a plan. He is going to find a way to get Uriah to come back for Uriah to sleep with his wife so that it looks like uh, 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 Uriah is the father of the child. Uriah comes back, and as we know the story, Uriah never slept with his wife, forcing David to move to plan B, where then Uriah uh, got killed with many other soldiers that were there in the ambush planned by David and, and General Joah. Bathsheba mourned for a month after her mourning period, then Bathsheba uh, married the King David. A child was born, a child born uh, who was full in conceivement, but uh, by timing it sounded wrong because a pregnancy will usually reveal itself after three weeks of a woman being pregnant, then signs will begin that something uh, is now happening, okay? So on average, when we look at the time, from the three weeks she found out she was pregnant, uh, up to another month of grieving her husband, she was already two months pregnant. So when she delivered the child in full term. It didn't make sense from the date she married David. So those who were calculating were coming up to seven months. And that's a problem because when people visit a baby, what do they see? They see a full term baby born in seven months. And that doesn't make sense. There are no health concerns, nothing whatsoever. And so people started to count. And even in Israel, there was murmuring about the birth of the child. And that's the third lesson I want to come into today. Sin always has an audience. When the devil leads us into sinning, he always, always makes sure it's private. But when it's time to humiliate us, 
he will fill a stadium. Do you hear what I'm saying? Whenever we are tempted to do wrong, it's always a private matter. But when it's time to be exposed, the devil will make sure that there is a stadium full of people with the cameras, with microphones. It will be the most humiliating interview of your life when now it is exposed. It happens all the time. When elders and pastors in our churches have been caught with extramarital affairs, what happens? In 10 minutes, 500 people have put it on social media. In a month, every Adventist in Africa knows. In three months, even those who live in Texas are aware of what happened. That is how the devil works. He always hires an, an, an audience for humiliation. And that maybe should make us understand why in the first place God was trying to protect us. Because it is this humiliation that we end up suffering. And maybe you need to hear me again here. It is not that God cannot rescue us. That's the problem. Oh no. The blood of Jesus has power over any sin we may make, over any mistake we may make. But let me tell you what Jesus cannot do for you. Jesus cannot make people forget. And Jesus cannot make people stop talking about it. And that is what has always worried God, that even after he has forgiven you, the world will continue to punish you. It is that humiliation, that embarrassment, that inability to go to church for the next six months, waiting for us to forget, only to show up at month number seven, and we still remember, and we start afresh. As soon as you walk through the door, we all start scratching and saying, this, this is the one, this is the one. And suddenly you relieve, you relieve the trauma of your sin. Christ has forgiven, but the devil has mastered the art of keeping the world aware of what you have done. And these are the things that God looks at and he pities us. And he says, I don't want my children to go through this. Yes, I have power to forgive their sin. However, there are things they will live through. A humiliation and a pain that I don't want them to go through. Now, David and Bathsheba were a spectacle of the nation as everyone was talking about this issue. And when the prophet came, Nathaniel, to address this very issue, it became clear a sin done at night between two people was now known by the whole nation. And of course, the God who had tried to warn them who had now sent a prophet to tell them that even I am aware just as the whole nation is aware. I think we need to appreciate this about God. I love this about God. I really, really love it. The way the man loves us, refuses to allow us to enter into humiliation, even though he is covered on his side. I mean, when you confess, he has already covered that part. He could always just say, look, I've given you Jesus. Your sin is forgiven. I am done. My part is complete. Now go see what you do for yourself. But still, but still, his love for us goes to that level of saying, yes, I know I can forgive you. Yes, I know the blood of Jesus is enough. However, you are going to suffer humiliation. You are going to suffer embarrassment. You are going to have to deal with people who will remember your sin for a very long time. Yes, I promised you, 
in the book of Jeremiah that I will remember your sins no more. But I did not say the world will forget. I said I will remember your sins no more. I did not say the world will remember your sins no more. And because the world is not like me, because the world delights in your suffering, in your humiliation, in your embarrassment, then please, please listen to me. Do not enter. Listen when I warn you so that you are saved the humiliation. And unfortunately, we don't. The last part of our story. Now that we know that there is a crowd prepared for humiliation. Number three. Then Nathaniel pronounces the judgment that the child was going to die. David fasted, prayed, confessed his sin. And of course, as the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us from all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to tell you, because you and I, we are all stupid sinners. We are not going to do what God has warned us about through the David and in this sermon. You and I are just stupid sinners. We don't listen. So you and I are going to mess up in spite of the signs that God gives. You and I are going to be in some messy, sticky situation one of these days. And God knows it. But there is good news. As much as God knows you and I are not going to listen to what the Spirit is saying tonight, He also wants us to be aware that there is no need to fall apart, to commit suicide, to destroy ourselves. The blood of Jesus is enough. When we confess our sins, when we cry out to God, we are never abandoned and we are never forgotten. There is always salvation in the kingdom of God. Lesson number four. On the seventh day, the child died. That's lesson number four. In everything you do, in everything you do, where you work hand in hand with the forces of darkness, be aware there will always be innocent victims. Someone will always suffer who should not be suffering. People have gone out for extramarital affairs. They brought back HIV for faithful spouses. There's always somebody who suffers. People have gone out for extramarital affairs. Children were born. Children who had to grow up without the pleasure of a mother and father in the same house. They had one mother, one father in another marriage, a, a, a mother still married to a different man, a father married to a different woman, because this child is a child of their extramarital affair. And a child will grow up suffering, questioning themselves and their value in life, wondering if their life is worth a living since they are a product of such a, a, a sin. People suffer who are innocent when we ignore God's warnings. This evening, before you make a conclusion that you do what you want to do and no one will stop you, let me ask you, have you looked at the collateral damage? Have you looked at those whose lives will be destroyed because of your actions? Have you really looked to see at the victims of your pleasure? Last lesson, lesson number five. When the child had died, David accepted that his sin had done what he could not change. 
the Bible says, then he worshiped the Lord. He got up, he ate, he bathed, and of course, he tried to move on with his life. And of course, as we know, later on, he will write Psalm 54 because of this experience, creating me a new heart and renew a steadfast spirit. But the point that I want to make here is this. In the end, David was then left with worship. Please listen to me. Things had fallen apart very bad. His worship doesn't mean things went right. A child was dead. A husband was dead. And he had been judged and he was humiliated. However, having gone through all of that and having confessed his sin, he accepted that he needed to get back to the full mandate of existence. His son Solomon would say it much better in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 in the end. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is what David did. He had to worship. He had to get back onto his purpose. And that's my last message this evening. Nothing will restore your life better than getting back to the purpose that God has given you. Sitting in the dark, weeping over your mistakes, trying to hide from the world that humiliates you is not going to change anything. The best way, the best way to revenge ourselves on the devil when he has misled us is to go back to worship. Nothing will ever, ever restore your life and cover for our multitude of sins more than going back to worship. You see, worship doesn't mean that people have stopped talking. Worship doesn't mean that when the world sees you, it doesn't remember your sins. Worship means you stop living by their rules and you start living by the rules of the God who has forgiven you. Worship is how you reclaim your life and you get back to your purpose. Worship is how you decide to say, I will not be controlled by my mistakes. I was stupid. I ignored the signs. I blundered. Some innocent people have suffered, but I have confessed my sin. I have laid bare before God and Calvary has come through for me. Now I'm not going to sit in my house and cry all day because people are gossiping about me. I am not going to uh, wear, you know, shades and, and hoodies wherever I go because people are talking about my blunder. What I'm going to do is I'm going to worship as a way of reclaiming my life. This sermon is not about a process, but about where you are. Some among us who are listening, you may be at the stage of David and Bathsheba in their houses. In other words, you are tempted, but God has shown the signs. And my prayer for you this evening is don't call Bathsheba. Don't go to David's house. Listen to the signs. Maybe you have already called Bathsheba and you have already sinned and Uriah is already dead. Then my prayer for you is like David, may you run very quickly to confession. Your only hope now is in Jesus.
anything you may try to do to fix will not work until you go to Jesus first. Listen to me. Run. Run as fast as you can to Jesus. If you've already killed Uriah and your sin is now pregnant, ready to produce more results, run to Jesus as fast as you can. He is your only hope at this moment. If the child of your sin has been born and the innocent are now suffering, you don't have a choice. Your only hope right now, my friend, is to run to Jesus. You better run to Jesus like you've never run before. You better get down down on your knees as soon as possible. Confess it all. Your only hope, our only hope is in Calvary. Maybe you are at that stage where you have confessed. You have run to Calvary. But now you are afraid to walk out the door. You are afraid of the world and its eyes. You are back from rehab. You are afraid of the eyes that will say, there she is, there he is, the alcoholic, the drug addict. Maybe you are now afraid after your extramarital affair to tell your wife, I have a child that is pregnant, or maybe you've told, now you are afraid to face the world that knows that after such an elder, a pastor, a woman's ministry leader that you were, you yourself were a sinner. Now you are afraid to face the world. Maybe you are now going through a divorce and you are afraid to face the world because you would be called a divorcee. I don't know. I don't know which humiliating thing may be facing you. But even here, the word of God has an answer. Now you worship. Now you worship like you've never worshipped before. Now you worship like crazy. Now you worship. Worship until they say you are overcompensating. That's okay. But now you worship. Because the only way you are going to reclaim your life and live your life without the world judging what you should do is by returning this life back to its maker and in him you will find your purpose again and you will see worship will produce purpose purpose will give a very meaningful life and when your life has meaning those who are judging you have no longer anything to hold against you because once again you have been restored and your life is too meaningful to be judgeable. Where are you this evening? Whichever it is, it is my prayer that you and I would take advantage of God's solutions. Are you still at the rooftop? Listen to the warning. Don't go there. Have you gone there? And now you have been caught and your sin has produced its consequences, confess, he is faithful and just. Have you confessed, but you are now afraid to leave? You are afraid to meet the world? Worship. When you worship, I promise you, you will find your restoration and your purpose. Three simple things this evening. Avoid if you've not started. Confess if you've already done it. Worship if you are now afraid of the consequences. 
That, I hope, is what we will do wherever we are, whatever we are going through. But giving up is not an option. Not an option. God has solutions for each of these stages. Grab the one you need and stay safe under his wing. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, this evening we want to thank you for loving us, for caring for us, to the point that you issue warnings when we are in danger of destroying ourselves. Father, I would not repeat because you've laid it out for us. The prayer is then simple. Help us to see the signs. Teach us confession. Give us strength to worship when we are afraid to face the world because of what we have done. Grant us these in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.